Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Good morning everyone. I'm Cindy Maka and I'm the director of the Western Museum of Flight at Torrance Airport. Imagine yourself hiking in the high Sierras above the Mendel Glacier. As you gaze out at this magnificent view, you spot an anomaly in the smooth, white, frozen surface of the glacier. You hurry over as fast as you carefully can, and you discover a body, not just any body, but a, a human body in a U.S. military uniform. With us today is Peter Steckel, and this is where the adventure begins. It is my privilege to introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Steckel. Good morning, everybody. I want to start by thanking Cindy and the Western Museum of Flight for inviting me to come here today and make this presentation for you. I also want to thank Pat Maka. When I first started working on Final Flight nearly six years ago, I came to this project not as someone who knew anything about airplanes or airplane wrecks. Um, a little bit about history, and that was about it. And a friend of mine, a writer friend of mine by the name of Eric Blem said, well, you got to talk to Pat. He's the first person you need to talk to about any of this stuff. And I contacted Pat. He didn't know me from Adam, but he opened up his archives to me, and he's opened up his house. And I can confidently say that if it wasn't for his help, Final Flight would not be the book it is. So thank you, Pat. So let us begin. This is the story of World War II. And in many ways, it is not well, in many ways, it's not an uncommon story, but it is certainly a story that is uncommonly told. In August of 2007, I was here on the Mendel Glacier in northern Kings Canyon National Park with my friend Michelle. We were, we were up there looking for wreckage of an airplane, very similar to this one. It's the Beach 18 AT-7 Navigator. And we're very fortunate today in having um, a representative of the Beach 18 out in the uh, front of the museum. So please do take an opportunity to look at it. It's an amazingly beautiful airplane in my estimation. Now it was called the AT-7 Navigator. AT stands for Advanced Trainer Navigator because it was used for navigator training. And this particular airplane that Michelle and I were interested in had been lost on November 18th 1942 with a crew of four. On board was the pilot, Second Lieutenant William Gamber, aviation cadet John Mortensen, aviation cadet Ernest Glenn Munn, and aviation cadet Leo Mustinen. They were in training to be navigators on the big bombers in early 1942, the B-17. Now, looking at the official report from 1942 when the aircraft disappeared, I was able to confirm that on November 18, 1942, an AT-7 with a number 4121079 had departed from Matherfield, California with a crew of four. Now, for those of you who don't know where Matherfield is, it's a uh, slightly east of Sacramento. So five years after the plane disappeared, four University of California Berkeley students were on a summer-long backpacking trip through Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. Now, all four of them were combat vets from World War II. And so when they came across airplane wreckage, they felt pretty confident that they knew what they were looking at. And here we see two of those students on the surface of the glacier. So they uh, continued their trip. This was at the beginning of the summer. They had gone up there pretty much on a whim. 
they brought their fishing poles. They were going to fish in a series of five lakes. They caught no fish. They looked up canyon. They saw this glacier, and they thought, well, let's go up there and check it out. At the end of the summer, they returned to Berkeley, and they were at a fraternity party, and everybody was talking about how they spent their summer vacations. And these four guys said, ah, yeah, remember that airplane wreck from the glacier at the beginning of summer? And they told their story, and it just so happened that one of their fraternity brothers was still in the reserves with the Air Force, stationed at Hamilton Field in Marin County. So the next day, this fraternity brother went to Hamilton Field, told his superior officers about what happened, and then members from the Air Sea Rescue crew contacted the students, talked one of them, William Bond, into guiding them up to the crash site. Now this is late September. It's certainly no longer warm enough as it would be in the summer. And the two captains had no mountaineering experience. You can see this is what they wore into the backcountry. <laughs> Bill Bond is a little bit more appropriately attired. Uh, he wore boots to walk in. They wore Oxfords. <laughs> but fortunately, for the first 25 or 26 miles, they didn't have to walk because they did those first few miles on a horse. So they covered that first 25 miles by horseback. They camped out in a um, snow survey cabin. And the following day, they hiked up to the, the crash site on the glacier, accompanied by a forest ranger and the owner of the horses. So they got up there, and it was cold. It was, after all, late September. They were wearing their Oxfords, and they uh, didn't have a good time walking across the ice of the glacier. And so Bill Bond uh, did all the work for them, for the most part. And he was able to relocate the two engines that they had found earlier in the summer and here we see a photograph of one of those engines. And on that engine was an identification plaque. And you can see this on the Beach 18 outside. And on that plaque was the number of the airplane, the registration number, 4121079. And that identification plaque is similar to this one from another airplane. So they spent uh, three days getting to the glacier and back. They spent three hours at the glacier and they returned empty-handed as their report shows. Uh, I want you to notice they were 10 days off. They figured maybe if they were said it was the 8th instead of the 18th that everybody would be 10 days younger. I'm not quite certain how that happened. It did say they were on Darwin Glacier, although they said the wreck was on Darwin Glacier. And they also said that no bodies were recovered. So since no bodies were recovered, the following year in 1948, the, the Army sent this fellow by the name of Captain Roy F. Salzbacher back up to the glacier. And he made two separate trips. He made a reconnaissance trip in July. And then in September, he brought these guys up with him. And their idea somehow had gotten into their heads that there was a complete aircraft buried in the ice of the glacier, and all they had to do was dig through the ice to find the airplane and the crew. Now, far be it for me to point out that the ice of a glacier is as hard as the concrete floor in this building, and that you weren't going to have much luck digging with that little short-handled shovel. But they were also prepared for glacier work because they had crampons. These are probably 18-point crampons made out of stainless steel. They probably weighed about 80 or 90 pounds each. Well, not really, but they were heavy. And um, they had this fine, high-tech climbing rope, probably manila sisal or something like that, maybe hemp. But I love to point out their boots. I'm not sure you can see it quite so well. But their boots were these rubber things that went up to like their knees, which they could then fold over as if they were going to be walking through knee-deep water, I guess. 
Well, they were equally as unsuccessful as the 1947 search team. And I think part of the reason was because Captain Salzbacher was suffering from a fatal disease. A couple days after they returned to the Presidio in San Francisco, he died from poliomyelitis. And polio is a disease that can affect many areas of the body, but the more common type is the kind that infects your lungs. So bear in mind that they were at an elevation of over 12,500 feet, vigorously digging through the glacier. And now imagine having a potentially, or not potentially, fatal disease of your lungs. I feel pretty confident that Captain Sulzbacher's expedition up to the glacier was responsible for his death. And um, we can see from his death certificate, poliomyelitis, the bulbar type, that's the type that infects your lungs. And he was buried at Golden Gate National Cemetery. And there the story stood forgotten, except for a few aviation archaeologists, a couple writers. But the story pretty much forgotten until late October of 2005, when a couple of climbers were uh, walking across the Mendel Glacier in preparation to getting to a very steep slope to do a, an ice climb, and they saw an object in the ice marked by the arrow. So let me point out that when you're at this elevation in late October in the Sierra Nevada, although it might be nice weather down here, it's uh, winter up there, and they had already in two days encountered snow, sleet, um, frozen rain, wind, fog, you name a nasty kind of weather and they had had it. And so they're walking across the glacier with their parka hoods up, covering their ears, blocking their peripheral vision. And the first climber walked by this object without being aware of it. The second climber was pretty much abreast of it. And he described to me, he didn't really know why he heard some material flapping in the wind and he didn't know why he could see something off to the side, but there it was. So what we're looking at is the, the nape of his neck at the top of the screen, his back, and the canvas pack that says 1984 is the registration number from his seat type parachute. So here's a, a mannequin wearing a similar type C-type parachute so you can get some kind of comprehension of the previous photo. So the climbers canceled their climb. They hiked out, reported their discovery to the Inyo County Sheriff who then contacted Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks because that's where the remains were located. And the Park Service waited a few days for some snowstorms to come in and leave. And then they flew by helicopter up to Mendel Glacier. And in sub-freezing temperatures, in the shade, over the course of the morning and the afternoon, they, as you can see, it had snowed since the climber's discovery. They walked through the snow. And using hand trowels and ice picks and ice axes, they spent the day chipping through the glacier to remove the remains of the person who became known as the frozen airman. At the end of the day, uh, they had isolated the remains on a block of ice approximately six feet long, three feet wide, and three feet deep, weighing about 600 pounds. So they slung it underneath the, the um, helicopter, and they flew it to the Fresno County coroner. Uh, the coroner had the duty of defrosting the remains, slowly over the course of several days, x-raying and ascertaining that the, re, uh, the person had not been uh, the victim of a violent crime. And then he was put into a casket and with full military honors, he was transferred to Hickam Field in Honolulu to the identification laboratory of JPAC. And JPAC stands for the Joint POW MIA Accounting Command and they're a branch of the United States military, and their mission is to recover, identify, and repatriate the remains of U.S. service personnel who have been killed in service to our country. Mostly this happens overseas, 
but it also happens domestically, as in this case, and in many cases in uh, uh, places like Alaska and throughout California. So it took them approximately six months, and using all that really sexy CSI stuff you see on TV, they were able to identify the remains as this boy, Leo Mustanen. But let me point out that even though they used all those sexy techniques, none of them worked because they all rely upon having genetic material from living blood relatives. And in some cases, having genetic material from the female side of the family. Unfortunately, Leo didn't have anyone from his mother's side of the family still alive. So they ended up using good old fashioned deductive reasoning. They found a identification tag on the flap of his shirt, similar to the one that says name badge. And looking at it under different colored light, they were able to see the letters of his name, the E and the O of Leo, the A of his middle name, and the M of his last name. And since they had genetic material to compare against the other three crew members who were not found, they, by process of elimination and deductive reasoning, said, well, these remains must belong to Leo Mustanen. But there were some interesting questions, um, interesting in the definition of the word as annoying. The official report from 1942 said that the discovery had been on Darwin Glacier. So how could that be? How could they have found airplane wreckage on Darwin Glacier when Leo Mustanen had been found on Mendel Glacier about a quarter of a mile away and around the corner? The official report also said that their mission had been from Mather Field near Sacramento north to Corning. So here's a map of California. You can see Mather Field. You can see Corning. And you can see the Mendel Glacier where Leo Mustanen had been found. So, so now this is odd. Why did the official report say they were north when they were found south. Now granted, granted, the three navigators were students, but even students should know the difference between north and south. And the official report said no bodies were recovered. Well then how come there was this headstone in the Golden Gate National Cemetery south of San Francisco? And I might add about 100 feet away from where Roy Sulzbacher had been buried in 1948. So, like I said, these were interesting questions, and I have been working as a freelance newspaper and magazine writer since 1991, and I finagled a magazine assignment from a small magazine called Sierra Heritage. They focus on the Sierra Nevada, and I wrote an article which appeared in the fall of 2006. It was called The Mystery of the Iceman, and I tried to answer those questions based on any kind of information I could get, stuff that Pat Maka supplied to me and other interviews with people. And in the course of doing all this research, it occurred to me that this was a story that deserved more than just the limited distribution in a small magazine, because the more I learned, the more I wanted to know and I figured if I wanted to know about this stuff, there must be some other people out there who would like to know the rest of the story too. And so there I was on the Mendel Glacier with Michelle in 2007. The big question I wanted to answer on my first trip was where was Leo Mustanen's airplane? Since none had been found with him on Mendel Glacier, maybe, maybe back in 1942, 19, excuse me, 1947 and 1948, maybe they hadn't been looking on the Mendel Glacier. Maybe they'd been looking on the Darwin Glacier, like the report said. So I wanted to confirm that. So, and to give you an idea of the scale of the Mendel Glacier, the figure in the foreground is Michelle. We're looking at an area that's probably the size of a couple of football stadiums. Well, we pretty much 
quickly found lots of evidence of an airplane on Mendel Glacier. We found one of the front wheels. We found an engine. We found a piece of another engine. We found a section of the wing. And we found lots of little pieces. The bottom right-hand corner is a fabric from one of the seats. The uh, upper left-hand photograph is a piece of the fuselage that's crumpled up like an accordion. And so as Michelle walked down the glacier, down what we call the fall line, I began to, to traverse a, 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 um, a line along the top of the glacier. And um, as you can see, it's a, a mix of rock and ice. It's not easy going. And I had a GPS unit in my hand with the coordinates from where Leo Mustanen had been found in October 2005, which I had gotten from a FOIA request at the Park Service. So my idea was I wanted to sit on the spot where Leo Mustanen had spent 63 years waiting to be discovered. And I was, as I was walking across the glacier, I saw an object. And from a distance, it looked like a small tree, about the height of this podium, maybe a little shorter. And it looked like this tree had been blackened and killed by the frost, and it was leaning up against the rock. So let me remind you, we're at 12,500 feet. Half the atmosphere with half the oxygen is below us. I'm an old duffer, and my brain doesn't work as well at high altitudes as it does at uh, sea level. Like, I feel like a genius right now because we're so, so low. And it didn't occur to me that I couldn't be looking at a tree because Look at that slope. There's no trees there. There's no grasses. There's no wildflowers. I mean, there's nothing up there. There aren't even any insects to bug you. There's just nothing up there that's alive except for Michelle and myself. And as I walked closer to this object, which I thought was a tree, I saw something shining in the sun that sure looked like a gold ring to me. And so those mental processes being what they are, I thought, hey, hey, some climber lost his wedding ring. And when he got home, he was in deep doo-doo. <laughs> but the good news is a subsequent climber found that ring, picked it up, slipped it on the end of this, a branch on this little tree so that when the first climber returned to Mendel Glacier, he would find it and all would be well once again. And that's when I realized that, and I've told this story dozens of times, and every time I get to this part, I always start to cry, so please bear with me. Because what I saw was not a tree, but the remains of a second member of the crew. This is his ring. So Michelle and I reported our discovery to uh, the backcountry ranger at McClure Meadow and the Park Service went up the following day and um, he wasn't uh, embedded in the ice like Leo Mustadin had been so it was quite easy for them to recover the remains and take them to Fresno and then once again shipped under full military honors he was taken to Hickam Field to JPAC to their identification lab, and um, about five months later, he was identified as Ernest Glenn Munn, known as Glenn to his family. So let's talk a little bit about the Beach 18 AT7 Navigator, because in order to understand the rest of the story, it's important to know something about the airplane and something about where it ended up. This is the AT7 Navigator, and it has some interesting features that we don't see in airplanes today. The first feature you'll notice at the top of the fuselage is a dome. It's a celestial dome. 
the Beach 18 uh, was designed as the first corporate airplane. It, uh, in its 32-year manufacturing history, it had over 32 different iterations. The AT7 was just one of those iterations. And over 8,000 aircraft were produced. There's only one other twin-engine airplane that had a longer and more productive history. And that's your exam question for today. Does anybody know what that airplane was? DC-3. DC Thank you very much. So Beach 18, also called the Twin Beach, because it had two engines. And above the, the um, fuselage was that celestial dome. It also had uh, an empennage and twin tails, because in the 1930s, aircraft designers didn't have a whole lot of experience with twin engine craft. And the idea was that what will happen if one of those engines was to die and no longer be functional, how could you steer the airplane with just one rudder? So they thought, well, each engine needs to have its own rudder. And so you see a lot of aircraft designed from the 1930s that were twin engine aircraft with twin rudders. Uh, the Lockheed 10 and 12 Electra, uh, similar to, you know, well, the, the uh, Amelia Earhart flew, looks very much like the Beach 18, just as another example. So the celestial dome, let's get back to that. Uh, there's, you can see two different types of celestial domes. The students would stand on a stool and using an octant, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner, they would do star sightings and plot their position using the same techniques of navigation that mariners had been using for hundreds of years. And one person I talked to who was a navigator in World War II uh, reminded me that they never knew where they were because it took, depending on how good a navigator you were, 15 minutes to a half an hour to plot your position. So he said, we always knew where we had been. <laughs> the interior of the Beach 18 in its first iteration as a corporate airplane, they had seats on one side and a sofa on the other. Well, they ripped all those out for the students and they had a, a row of three student desks. And these were the same desks that all of us, all of us sat at in junior high school and or high school where the chair and the table are all bolted together and then they would bolt the whole thing down to the floor. And they had a set of, of navigation instruments as well as the, the six pack instruments from the cockpit mounted back in the cabin so the students had everything they needed to plot their courses. They had no reason to be in the cockpit to bother the pilot. Another iteration of the Beach 18 was the AT-11, which uh, had the nose taken out and a glass dome, a plexiglass dome, put in for uh, bombardier practice. On the top of the fuselage was this kind of football-shaped object. Inside of that was the ADF, the Automatic Direction Finder, state-of-the-art radio navigation for the 1940s. And all in all, as Jim, uh, who owns one of these, would say, it is one beautiful airplane. So how did I get involved in the frozen airman story? Well, it all began with Boy Scouts. When I was 12 years old, I went up to Camp Wolverton in Sequoia National Park with my troop, and we went backpacking. But before we went backpacking, we had to get in shape because we were at a high elevation, so we went on some walks. And being a kid from Southern California, from West LA, I'm not embarrassed to tell you, I had never seen trees this big. I'd never seen a waterfall like this. And I'd never seen a scene like this. So I want you to picture this scrawny 12-year-old carrying an 8,000 pound pack on his back, <laughs> on his hands and knees, dragging himself up the trail with blood coming out of my fingernails from the rocks. I'm last in line, get up to the scenic viewpoint, and I think I'm going to die. I'd never worked that hard in my sweet short life. And then I get to this point and I see this view and I thought I had died. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I'd never seen anything like this in my sweet short life, and I instantly fell in love. Fell in love for the first time with the Sierra Nevada, and I've spent the rest of my life 
whenever I can, being there, hiking and climbing, studying it, reading books about it, um, and trying to find out everything I could about the Sierra Nevada mountains. And based on my experience and my knowledge, too much of this story didn't make any sense. The route, north to Corning? How could they end up 150 miles southeast? If no bodies were recovered, why was there that headstone at Golden Gate National Cemetery? And how could the frozen airmen be found on Mendel Glacier when the official report said Darwin Glacier? All of the newspaper, television, radio, all those reports from 2005 all the way up to and including my own discovery in 2007, they didn't answer those questions at all. In fact, all they did was muddy the water. So let's discuss why it took so long for the frozen airmen to be discovered in the first place. So let's go back to Mendel Glacier. Well, one reason why it took so long for the discovery is because glaciers are shrinking. And next. <laughs> and they're shrinking because the ice in the glaciers is melting faster than new ice is being formed. So for, in, for instance, the two top photos is Mendel Glacier in 2007, and the two bottom uh, photos is the glacier, the same view in 1948. And if you look on the screen, X marks the spot and Y marks the spot. And particularly in the left photograph, when you compare it to its companion below, you can see an immense amount of ice has disappeared. Anything deposited in that glacier in 1942 became incorporated into the ice of the glacier, more snow falling on top of it, turning to ice, entombing the remains as well as the pieces of the airplane. And so it would take a long time for all of that ice to melt and expose the remains. But Mendel Glacier is kind of an odd duck because it's a mix of rock and ice and the rock inside the ice and the rock on top of the ice serves to insulate the ice and retards the ice from melting. So it would take much longer for an object in a rock glacier to melt out than in a clean glacier. A clean glacier like the Darwin Glacier just around the corner. Now the Darwin Glacier is called a clean glacier because it is essentially is a big ice cube. And those big ice cubes will melt in the sun, they'll wash away from rain, and they'll, and they'll melt a lot faster because they don't have that insulative layer of the rock. So the remains took a long time to be found because it took a long time for that particular glacier to melt. Now what about the confusion about Mendel Glacier and Darwin Glacier. Well, I, I had posted a lot of this stuff and my theories and my continuing research on the Final Flight blog, including the names of the captains who went up to the crash site in 1947. And the daughters of one of those captains, Robert Lewis, saw his name on my website and they contacted me hoping that I could supply them with information from their father. Their father flew a B-17 in the 8th Air Force. He flew, I forget the number now, but it was close to 50 missions. And he, did, and he didn't really ever talk about his wartime experience. And his daughters wanted to know about what their daddy did during the war. So they contacted me hoping that I could supply them with information. I was hoping that they could supply me with the same information. But they did have photographs that Captain Lewis had taken in 1947, and they did have his topographic map. And on his topographic map, which they very graciously lent to me along with his photographs, he had circled Mount Darwin. Mount Darwin, just north of Mount Darwin, is the Darwin Glacier. Just north of the Darwin Glacier is the Mendel Glacier. And I was convinced that if Captain Lewis circled Mount Darwin, he probably thought 
he was on the Darwin Glacier. So that settled the mystery of Darwin versus Mendel Glacier. He, they were just confused. And the final reason why it took so long for Glenn and Leo to be found is because the Mendel Glacier is incredibly remote, which is not to say that it is incredibly difficult to get to. In my younger days, I could get there in a day. As I said, I'm an old duffer now. It takes me three days, two days to hike in, and a third day to get up to the glacier. But it's hard work getting there, and it's remote, and there's no reason for people to go up there unless they're climbers coming to climb this really, really steep field of ice known as the Mendel Coulars. How steep? At the bottom, it's 60 degrees. Towards the top, it's nearly vertical, and it's about this wide. So it's remote. You need extreme technical ability to climb, and the ice doesn't form every year. So you can go for years without anyone ever going up there. And that's the final reason why it took so long for the remains to be found. So the next question, how is it that three navigators could get lost, even if they were students? And why would a pilot, who I think it's natural to assume would know where he's going, why would the pilot allow the students to get him lost? To answer this question, we need to know their exact route. Was it really Mather Field to Corning, or was it something else? I thought it was something else, and digging through the, the uh, official records, I found a telex buried that gave the route. It's highlighted in yellow. It says the de destination was Mather nor uh, south to Los Banos, and then north to Roseville, which is near Sacramento, and then north to Orland, which is near Corning, and then back to Mather Field. So essentially the I-5 corridor of today, south, then north, then south. And it also had the weather report for the day. And uh, basically it said that from Mather Field south to Stockton, the visibility was, uh, um, let's say, three to four miles, you know, unlimited after that. It said that the ceiling was 3,000 feet in, in uh, Red Bluff with broken clouds and light rain, but that the weather was clearing and that everything to the south was just hunky-dory. Not exactly uh, uh, Cavu type, uh, clear above, visibility unlimited flying, but still not bad weather. Uh, certainly not horrible, horrible weather that would get a, a pilot buried in the clouds or a navigator confused and not knowing where they are. So I thought about that for a long time, and I think I came up... You gotta love it. I think I came up with the, what I feel confident is their real route, but I'm not gonna tell you, because if I told you, there'd be no need for you to read my book. <laughs> and here we see the exact route marked out on the map. Mather Field, south to Los Banos, north to, uh, to Orland, back to Mather Field, and then off to the right, the location of Mendel Glacier. So I think it's curious that Mount Mendel and the crash site is due east of what would have been the crew's southernmost uh, point. And for a while I thought, well, maybe they had drifted over the mountains. But then I talked to some Beach 18 pilots and they said, well, you know, the service ceiling, it's 20,000 or over 20,000 feet, um, but they didn't, we don't like to fly that high because we burn a lot of fuel and the airplane doesn't have that much power, even with superchargers. I mean, after all, it's, the aircraft was designed in the 1930s. And so then I talked to some people who flew the Beach 18 in navigation training and they said, yeah, we hardly ever got over 5,000 feet. Usually we're flying about one or 2,000 feet close to the ground. So an airplane flying with those parameters, I didn't really believe it could drift 
over the Sierra Nevada mountains where the peaks rise to nearly 14,000 feet. I don't think they would have done that. And to fly at high elevation, all the pilots in here know once you get above 15, you need to be on supplemental oxygen. So that's why I didn't think the stated route was correct. But once again, I'm not going to tell you what I think the real route was. But I do want to tell you something about the boys on board. And I call them the boys because in the 1930s and 40s, what we now refer to as young men were, were referred to as boys. I think these boys, like all the boys of their era, grew up excited by the most wonderful, absorbing, and exciting mechanical object, objects ever created by human beings up to that time. Airplanes. Just as kids today might get really excited about their iPods and um, computer games, the kids in the 30s were really into airplanes. And the popular media knew that. There were books, Tom Swift books about airplanes, movies with Earl Flynn, like the Dawn Patrol, about World War I fighter pilots. Howard Hughes' book about World War I, Hell's Angels. What do I know? Maybe they thought if they joined up, they'd get to meet somebody like Gene Harlow. I think I would have. <laughs> so the pilot was uh, William Gamber. And I like to ask people if they could tell that Bill Gamber's father was the town barber. This is Bill's high school graduation photo. He grew up in a small town in western Ohio called Fayette. He uh, lived in this house on F Street. And in high school, because he was tall, he lettered in basketball. He played trombone in the school orchestra. And he was a straight-A student. So he went to college at Tri-State University in Angola, Indiana, about an hour away from home, where he once again lettered in basketball, played in the school orchestra, worked on the school yearbook staff, was a member of a fraternity back in the days when fraternities were service organizations instead of places to drink beer and meet girls. And he also finished a four-year degree in mechanical engineering in three years. This in an era before handheld calculators, when slide rules had just been invented. I think Bill Gamber was one smart kid. Also on board, and at age 25, the oldest of the crew was John Mortensen. He was a first-generation American. His family had come from Sweden. They were farmers, and they lived in Moscow, Idaho. Ernest Glenn Munn, aviation cadet, was also on board. His, uh, the girls in his hometown called him the Blonde Bomber. And he got this nickname. He was 6'5", devilishly good looking. I think if someone had made a movie of Glenn Munn when he was alive, they would have had Van Johnson starring as Glenn. He got the nickname, he had, Glenn had three younger sisters and his younger sister was in high school Glenn would drive from the family farm down into Wheeling. So Glenn lived in eastern Ohio near the border with West Virginia, so the high school was in Wheeling, West Virginia. Glenn would drive down there at the end of the day to go pick up his little sister, Lois. So Lois was telling me the story when I went to Glenn's funeral, and she said that she was outside the, um, the high school somewhere in town waiting for Glenn to pick her up, and all of a sudden, all her girlfriends start giggling and laughing. And she has no idea what's going on. And, she, and so she's asking them why they're giggling and laughing. And they're pointing up the street at her brother. And she, she still doesn't get it. And, the, and one of the girls, so this is Lois telling me the story. One of the girls says to Lois, oh, he's just so dreamy. <laughs> so the girl started calling him the blonde bomber. And Lois was really proud. She said, that's my big brother. So she scored points. So Glenn, like the other three boys on board, enlisted in the Army Air Forces before Pearl Harbor. It's that airplane connection again. They did that so they'd have their choice of what service branch to serve in. They all wanted to fly. He did his uh, initial training at uh, the Santa Ana Army Air Forces base in Santa Ana. It was an Air Force base, 
with no airplanes, no hangars, and no runways. But that's where all the cadets went to initially for classroom study on uh, uh, flying, navigation, bombardiering, uh, physics, mathematics, all that type of stuff. When he got leave, he and his buddies would go on down to Corona Beach to hang out. And I like to say that the guy on the left is the one who is out of uniform today. <laughs> and Glenn is the second from the right. While in Santa Ana, Glenn met and started dating a young woman by the name of Marilyn Dick. After he disappeared, I discovered Marilyn lived until the mid-ish to late 1960s, and she never married. Uh, the fourth boy on board was Leo Mustanen. Leo's family was from Finland when Finland was part of Russia. And Leo was also a first-generation American. Leo had a half-brother who uh, married a local woman. He was from Brainerd, Minnesota. And so here's Leo posing with his sister-in-law. His sister-in-law and his brother had two kids. So some last thoughts to share with you. Um, and these are my thoughts about why I think this story is so important. And to me, I think the story is important because at the beginning I said it's not an uncommon story. Lots of people died in World War II. But it is a story that is uncommonly told because it involves our service men and women who died in the United States serving their country. According to the Department of Defense, there were 16.1 million soldiers from the United States who served during World War II. All service branches, 16.1 million. Of course, they weren't all combat. Of those 16.1 million, there were 671,000 who were wounded. There were 405,000 casualties. There were 291,557 killed in action. Other non-combat deaths, 113,000. 842, or fully 28% of our service personnel who died in World War II were non-combat deaths. And to me that meant there were actually three fronts during the war. For sure the European and Af North African front, South Pacific, and the third front that I like to call the home front. And those 113,000 service personnel who died on the home front are a story that you do not learn in school, in your history books. They don't make movies about them. They don't make television programs about them. The Army Air Forces, between 1941 and 1945, lost over 4,500 aircraft shot down in the South Pacific. In comparison, 7,100 aircraft were lost in the United States due to accidents or crashes during transportation. And those 7,100 aircraft claimed the lives of 15,530 pilots, crew members, and ground personnel in over 52,000 separate accidents. And thinking of these losses was a revelation to me. And, and it's not just the losses of our, our boys and the women in the United States. It's those other losses as well. And the effect it had on people's families that I'd never really deeply considered. And these four boys were just four of those 15,000 who never made it overseas. And it put to mind something that I had read, spoken by Robert Kennedy. And Robert Kennedy was talking about Vietnam, but I think his words have the same meaning for the boys we lost in World War II and the boys that we lost before that and continue to lose. And he said, here while the moon shines, men are dying on the other side of the earth. Which of them might have written a great poem? Which of them would have cured cancer? 
Which of them might have played in a World Series or given us the gift of laughter from a stage or helped build a bridge or a university? Which of them might have taught a child to read? It is our responsibility to let those men live. And I believe that it is our responsibility to live our own lives with honesty and with integrity to honor their sacrifice. I know there's, there's always lots of questions and I'd love to answer questions. And if you, want to, if you have stories to tell, then please do because you know, learning is not a one-way avenue and it's a two-way thing. And I, I learn lots at these things. So questions? So she noticed how everybody was alphabetically arranged. Yes, that's how they did it. They'd have everyone was in a list and then they would divide them up into elements of three and they did their training together, they went to school together and they lived in the barracks together. So the likelihood is that these three boys, they were around day 40 of their training. Uh, they probably knew each other pretty well. They may or may not have known Lieutenant Gamber. So the four people on board, what happened to the other two? They're still up there. And I have an outstanding promise to their families to continue going up to Mendel Glacier for as long as I'm able to do it. I'm not going to go up there this year because you guys got a heck of a lot of snow. And September is the time to go up there before the snow begins to fall again. And I don't think enough snow will melt to uh, uncover anything. I've made about a dozen trips up there already since 2007, including one where I took uh, Glenn Munn's, two of his nephews and one of his grandnephews. So he's asking about the headstone. <laughs> yeah, it's in there, um, but that's a valid question. He's asking about why was there this headstone with the names of the four boys on it if, as we can now positively ascertain, no remains ever were recovered. The, the long story, which I won't tell you because it is in Final Flight, actually begins with the Civil War. But the Reader's Digest version of it is that it became the policy of our country more so than any other nation in the world to not leave any soldier behind in a foreign land. And because of that, we, we continue to spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year, JPAC does, to recover, repatriate, and identify the remains. But after World War II, with so many casualties and with so many unknowns, the army had to be creative. And so think about ever going to a veteran cemetery and you see a headstone for eight crew members of a boat that was lost at sea. So how could there be a headstone for a Navy crew if they were lost at sea. And it's the same idea with an, with an air crew. You're flying at 30 or 35,000 feet in a high performance aircraft with aviation fuel in it and you get shot down and maybe the airplane explodes in the sky or maybe it spins out of control down to the ground where it, it hits and explodes and catches on fire. You normally, there aren't very many remains left to bury. And in those cases, the military would gather what they could, put it in a, in a casket altogether, and, and have a, a group burial. And it, with th these ideas in mind, it doesn't take much to imagine that if they were unsuccessful in finding the remains, particularly after Captain Salzbacher died, they would contact the families and say, well, yes, we were successful. We're going to have a, a funeral for your sons, and now you'll have a place to come to mourn. And I think that's why. How far apart were the bodies? Uh, about 100 feet from each other. Is there a determination of where the plane crashed? I have some ideas. Uh, I could, well, it's, it's in final flight, and I don't want to be coy with you, but to explain my ideas would take a lot of time because it involves figuring out things about um, flying, the route, the glacier, uh, atmospheric phenomenon, and that type of stuff. But I think I have a good idea. And I'm sorry, what was your, the third question? 
Oh, so how far from the wreckage were Glenn and Leo? Uh, the airplane wreckage is scattered all over the glacier. And the, in, originally in 1947, when they found the, the wreckage, in the report, it describes the wreckage being strewn across a 60 degree slope and across the, um, the glacier. And so as the glacier is melted, some of that material has subsided in place. And some of it, like the engines, which were way up high on the glacier, as we can see from the photographs, um, they're now down at the bottom. So a long ways away from the wreckage. JPAC was really excited by these two discoveries because they had, they had almost a complete body. And normally, when they go out on a recovery uh, from errant crew or soldiers who had been lying on the surface of the earth for decades, they're lucky to find tattered pieces of uniform, a button or two, maybe an, uh, a collar insignia, and pieces of bone like toothpicks. Yeah, how high was the wreckage? And if they were training at three to 5,000 feet, it seems odd that they would be very high. So the wreckage is about 12,500 feet um, on a northwest facing slope. And um, how they got up there is, I won't spoil it for you. <laughs> so if, if there's no, no more questions, uh, I do want to once again thank you all for being here. Um, I also thanks to Cindy and the museum for hosting the event today. There's a lot more to the story than I could ever tell you today. And there's a lot more to the story than I could ever write in Final Flight. And if you're interested in pursuing everything that I, that I learned and everything I researched, then I encourage you to go to my website, which is finalflightthebook.com. I have almost four years worth of blog entries that document my research. Lots more photographs. Um, there's video, there's links to all sorts of things. So if you want to pursue the story, then please do that. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.